here we go. So um, welcome everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wiradjuri, Gunawal, Gundagara and Birupai peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located uh, and pay respect to their elders past and present. So welcome, this is a, an auspicious occasion. This is the first School of Information and Communication Studies research seminar. Um, so these uh, seminars are organized by the six um, uh, research committee uh, and a continuing uh, a long tradition, I guess, from CIS and SCCI and earlier of regular fascinating research seminars. Um, and uh, I did circulate to staff in six um, an email a few weeks ago about how to sign up to do one of these. So I'll just quickly um, promote that again. Um, there have there've been two, we've got two more scheduled for this month, actually, with Seema Afsal and, uh, and David Cameron. So details about those will be going out um, soon. Um, now, our speaker today is Dr. Louise Curram, and I emphasize the doctor because Louise was uh, formally uh, awarded her PhD in July, so it's very much worth um, emphasizing, and congratulations to Louise, uh, and I believe actually her talk today is based on that, um, on that doctoral work. Um, but as well as being a doctor of philosophy, Louise is an archivist and media artist, uh, a researcher, and a lecturer into the archives, records, and collections subjects. Uh, here in six. Um, so Louise um, is going to present for around 45 minutes or so, um, and then there'll be an opportunity um, for questions at the end. So I think that's quite enough from me. Um, so without any further ado, I'll pass over to you, Louise. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. So I just want to also acknowledge that here we all are on unceded Aboriginal lands and I want to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today and to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And also just to point out this amazing tradition we get to be part of in Australia every time we do cultural work together. Some of you are my students who are here and you've heard me say this lots of times, but it's always really good to just actually let that sink in for a moment, just how old these traditions of cultural practice are in this environment we live in. So, and that's particularly pertinent for me because of course I'm talking about um, different kinds of knowledges. So I've got, a, I've made you a promise today in my abstract, but just before I start, I'm gonna indulge in acknowledging Simon's comment about this being the first school of information and communication studies research seminar of us as a joined together school. So it's really great from my perspective that I'm the first speaker because I'm quite a useful embodiment of this relationship between the communications world and the information world. So I have a long, my first training was in film and throughout my career, I have maintained this practice with old media, which is kind of undergirds everything I do. This relationship with this material stuff that relies on different kinds of technology to produce images. So I've got a wall of these Super 8 cameras, these Super 8 projectors that sit up here looking down at me while I work. And I'm constantly reminded of these material conditions of making information and their creative and um, social potential. So what am I going to talk to you about today? So I'm just going to flick over to my slides and I'm going to stick them into presenter view. Just a second. Technology is always a challenge. So I take it that you can see, just let me know, I'm sure you can see metadata as growth rings tending the archive. Yeah, I'm taking it, you can. Um, so what am I here to talk to you about? I've promised you a talk about the promise of digitization. In my abstract, I've told you that some things will digitize poorly. My definition of these things that digitize poorly uh, are that they rely on experience and being there in person. So what I'm gonna do is discuss my research in this area. So some things we care about must change over time. For some items, freezing them in the form they were created halts the opportunity to actually experience them. 
We can't stop the clock at 1976 and bring that moment into the present, nor can we transport ourselves back to it. So using, a, using an example of 1970s artwork, my talk sets out how the inevitable changes to this work in its movement from 1976 to a present time are valuable. They're worth capturing and adhering to the original work in a relationship where that work stays whole, but the new iterations metaphorically wrap around it in a relationship that's like a growth ring. So hence my title, Metadata as Growth Rings. And this comes from my PhD research, which had a very long title that began with this phrase, tending the archive. What its subtitle explained was this role of use in helping us keep and care for the things that matter to us that rely on these elements of performance. These things where we, we can't actually turn back time, nor can we bring that thing into the present as it was in the time in which it first existed. So my case study result revolves around this 1970s artwork, 1976, a piece called Man with Mirror. Man with Mirror was made by British artist Guy Sherwin. And in the case of Man with Mirror, nothing is broken yet. It's an artwork that until fairly recently, until the work that I'm going to discuss took place, relied upon the artist Guy Sherwin performing it. But will Guy still be, Guy will not be around 30 years from now. So why does it need Guy to perform it now? The piece involves film Guy mixing with live Guy in a four-phase choreography recorded in the film. That's repeated live. So what we have is we have a situation where um, the person in the film stands outside, shoots this footage of himself in the park. He carries out these certain movements with the mirror. In performance, he then maps the mirror to his body, so holds his hands in the same position, maps himself to the film, and performs the same movement, slightly offset, with the film projected onto him. What happens is this really kind of simple but strange experience where we know we can see the film projector, we can see the screen that he's holding, we know what's going on, but as that mirror moves and we lose track of the film image and we see the real person, we have this intermixing. And this intermixing becomes really, what it elicits from the audience is these oohs and ahs of what is film guy, what is real guy. So when Guy first made this work, what he was getting at was the slippage between the outside and the inside. But what's happened over time is it's become a work that's focused on this gap in Guy's age that's about this slippage between Guy in 1976 and Guy in 2020. So Guy is now in his 70s, so time's running out for him performing this work. So copies of this work, the film components have been digitised, have been um, printed to 16 millimetre film and are kept in the collection of iFilm in Amsterdam. So we could say Guy's work is preserved. But of course, the reality is that without Guy, what do we have? How is this work going to work? So from my perspective as a um, researcher interested in these questions of responding to this impetus that we have this expectation that digitization will capture and store most, almost everything important to us. This is a really, this struck me as a particularly useful site to explore this question where actually digitization and recording, which in my mind is a stand-in for archiving, this business of texted records of something of the past fails. So as an archivist and as a media artist, I was really intrigued by this problem that Man with Mirror presents. Through the course of my practice, I evolved, I, I discovered this area of work that Man with Mirror belongs to, which is called expanded cinema. So this is a form of practice that evolved in the late 60s and early 70s that dealt with the interrelationship between technology, 
and performing bodies. By the time Guy made Man with Mirror, indeed expanded cinema was really on the wane. So the, the group of artists he was working with were located in London in a really kind of interesting cultural moment of a mix all the arts environment in a situation where the terrain vague of London, as film scholar Laura Reynolds, uh, um, uh, I forgot the name, Lynn, Laura, Laura Reynolds, how could I forget her name, um, accounts where real estate was still cheap. It was getting more expensive, but spaces were available for artists. These artists were able to access the technology. They had a 16 mil film printer, they had equipment. They were able to make these works and explore this medium in a really material and um, concrete way in, involved with the image itself and the production of the image. So what they were intrigued by was getting audiences away from the soporific immersion and narrative and they were wanting to get audiences to think about where they were, to identify their situation in the room with people next to them, with the technology at hand. So they wanted to bring attention to the situation in which this experience was taking place. As Guy started working in this vein in the mid-70s, um, things were changing. So the focus, the cultural focus was shifting from this discourse about control of information and the politics of information to the politics of identity. And so Guy's work is a really interesting uh, interlude where he joins technology with this really kind of slightly unintentional from him, indeed quite unintentional from him, focus on his representation, his self-representation, using himself as this, this figure within this film that then is projected onto himself. So Man With Mirror has had, a, had a, a hiatus of about 20 years where the work was barely shown. In the, late two, in the early 2000s, it was rejuvenated, largely through the efforts of film curator Mark Webber, who interestingly was the bassist in Pulp before he devoted his life and attention to the world of experimental film. And Mark Webber toured a collection of these works from the 70s internationally. And when audiences met this work in the early 2000s, they were intrigued. And this rejuvenated works by Anthony McCall. Some of you will know his work, Long Film for Ambient Light, that's been shown quite extensively in Australia. And it's a material film that involves a phenomenon, creates the phenomenon of a cone over 30 minutes. It's, it's like a piece of weather that takes place inside the art gallery. So these kinds of physical immersive experiences, this kind of lived experience of the relationship between the technology and the performer is really essential to these works. So let's just recap on that problem. So our problem is that 30 years time, Guy will definitely not be around. Unlikely he'll still be performing in 20 years. Really interesting if he is, because he will by then be very elderly. But we have a limited time span in which we are going to be able to experience this piece as Guy created it. We've got those components preserved in the film museum, but the question is how useful are they to us? And the answer to that question is limited use. So the film curator in question at the I Film Museum in research with Maya Darrell Hewins, a British researcher, explained that from her perspective, it's the role of the film museum to keep those components and to control the future performances of Man with Mirror. And in her mind, it's possible that a good fit to achieve that performance will be Guy's son. My argument, is, well, my response to that is I've conducted a test. So what I did was I shot footage of my mother performing Guy's film. And I have attempted a performance with that material of my mum. What I learned from that material was that this slippage between the live performer and the real performer, the recognition between those two people becomes really, really important. So let's fast forward to the real guts of my research project. So to cut a long story short, a manual was created for Man With Mirror. So my colleague, 
in my my colleague within the artist collaboration teaching and learning cinema Lucas Eileen and I created this manual for guys artwork man with mirror so what this does is something that's really important for this these key points I want you to take from my talk today what it does is it's basically an account an account of our experience of reenacting guys work so what's really important is for you to latch onto that word it is our account so guy didn't authorize this guy didn't make or approve this guy knew we were doing this and he gave us his blessing he was really keen to be involved and indeed he coached us in person about how to restage his work but this was a creative project that Lucas and I set up outside of institutions as a creative investigation of our own. What the manual represents is a chronicle of that experience of actually making Man with Mirror ourselves. What we did set out to do was to try to be as faithful as we could to recording what we felt was necessary to achieve something as close as possible to Guy's work. So we weren't trying to riff on Guy's work or make a cover version of Guy's work. We weren't trying to um, put our authorship on top of Guy's piece. We were trying to stay as true to the rules and rigors of Guy's work as we could. So what happened in the course of my PhD research was that I commissioned a couple of tests of that mirror. So here we are, I'm just going to flick through and show you. So here we are, the mirror. So here is our, here's Lucas at work with our, one of our test sites. So this is Laura Hindmarsh, who is a, an artist who's a, a good decade younger than me, who currently lives in the UK. And Laura took the manual and tried it out. She tried it out with assistance from Lucas and I. And what happened for Laura was she was able to achieve a performance. She presented that performance in London to the community she's part of, which includes Guy. So lots of people who know all about this work and really understand the ins and outs of it. And what happened for Laura was there was a number of slips she made to the work. So these slips emerged. It wasn't that she, she too set out in this particular piece to try to stick with the rules and rigors of the work. But what happened for her was actually an aesthetic problem. She felt as a young female, 30 years younger than Guy, it was completely strange for her to just perform his work. So what she did was add her own voice, quite literally, to Guy's piece. And what she then did was create an account of her. So, so there's two points I want to make here. So we've got we've had this idea that this mirror, this manual is an account. So what I'm going to get to is that Laura added her growth ring through her account. So she what she ended up giving back to TLC to man with the mirror to woman with mirror which is the name of tlc's piece was her story of use her account which is now added to that manual but she also found something really productive for her audiences which was her own customizations that reflected her aesthetic response to the work but also her techno-cultural situation what was unique to her environment um, that um example gets a bit complicated to explain because what she did was she did one version that was very true to guy's pace and then she did another version where she transposed it to 16 mil and in that process all kinds of interesting things emerged about that slippage between the super 8 and the 16 mil by doing this format shift this migration things about the work emerged that were really quite different from what had been there in the super 8 but she was still adhering by and large to the rules and rigors of man with mirror. So we then flash forward to the second case study site, which was the artists in New Zealand. And I foolishly deleted them from my slide set. That was a mistake. 
Um, and the artists in New Zealand tested the manual with no assistance from teaching and learning cinema. And what these guys did was they, they, they had no feel for Super 8 at all. So their immediate default was to move to digital. What that brought up for them was all kinds of problems, really pragmatic, what appeared to be very boring problems that really shaped their work, like the fact that the video projector angle was very difficult to achieve a match between the hands. So these kinds of small details led them to reconfigure the works in ways that's really quite, that moves, shifts the work in a really, um, shif shifts the work. And what I want to draw your attention to is this gap, is that this gap from the rule following delivers something new, but something that is interesting in relationship to that original work. And so here we're starting to form this picture of this metadata as growth ring, of this experience of this next user as a really important part of the story of this work. For those of you who deal in the world of archives, you'll be going, I've heard this before. This sounds like participatory archiving. And you're right. This is connected to these concepts of bringing perspectives from different users to talk back to the original work. What's really important here is that it does two things. It both enriches the item. It draws attention to what its, um, its experience in its contemporary environment is. It also does something else that I think is really essential. What it does is strengthen. So this is where we cut to these ideas of Walter Benjamin and his um, work on Nikolai Leskov. So um, hard to get around contemporary theses in the arts and humanities without a mention of Walter Benjamin. And because chains of transmission matter greatly to my research ideas, these lineages, the way things connect and link, always important when talking about Walter Benjamin to acknowledge the amazing efforts of Hannah Arendt in bringing him to our awareness through her translations. So what's important about this stuff about Nikolai Leskov? What's important is the way Benjamin draws out that stories don't exhaust themselves. Stories strengthen themselves in the retelling. So what's really essential in my model is what the point I made at the beginning, that the manual is a chronicle. It's a story of TLC's use of Man With Mirror, of our experience of making Man With Mirror. If you, in 20 years time as a curator, happened upon this manual, you would ask yourself, hmm, is this an authorised version of Guy Sherwin's work? And the answer to that is no. Is this a record of Guy Sherwin's work? Well, that's an interesting question. Does it have traces of Guy Sherwin's work within it? It contains some archives from Guy Sherwin. So it's got some drawings that Guy made of how Man with Mirror should be set up. But to say it's a trace of Man with Mirror is not really accurate. To say it's a trace of teaching and learning cinema's experience of Man with Mirror, trace is not the right word. What it is is an account, a chronicle. And if we follow Benjamin, what we learn from Benjamin is that the power of a story is that it, it's, it, it's, it grows stronger in the retelling, especially when it's a chronicle, when it chronicles experience. The retelling of that experience strengthens that experience. Now, that can be positive and that can be negative. So one of the issues with archives is that it gives us the potential to constantly retell concepts that are problematic to continue to retell, that need to be told in a different way or through a different lens. So in a country like Australia, that immediately takes us to the stories of the colonial, of, of, the, of the settler First Nations contact and how we tell these stories, the repetitions we make of them, the responsibilities that go with those repetitions, and how can we meaningfully update 
those retellings. So what I'm offering you, part of what I'm offering you, is this, this idea that this is a chronicle. So then Laura adds her chronicle. And the New Zealand artists have not at this stage, but they will, when I finally harass them enough to actually give me the stuff that I need, be able to add their story to this. And what this does, so this is where I, this is the bit that I think is really kind of important in this narrative, is this strengthening. So usually in the world of heritage and conservation, our understanding of caring for objects revolves around setting things aside, putting them in special places, removing them from circulation, cutting them off from other connected items. And of course, archivists spend their lives trying to connect stuff intellectually. So, you know, we're kind of quite devoted to this idea of connection. But nonetheless, the practices, the material, the physical practices of caring for objects usually involves control conditions, limiting use. And um, uh, yeah, those are two of the key measures that that pertain. So what I'm in my model, what I'm talking about is a model of circulation. It's a preservation of doing. So use doesn't wear things out. Use makes things stronger. So I just want to add another point about this business of the chronicle in the story. So we've got this data of Nikol Nikolai Leskov from Walter Benjamin. So the other piece of data we have comes from some research that um, uh, was conducted by Ross Gibson and some of his colleagues about emergency situations and the role of narrative in emergency situations. And how one of the things that narrative does is to add, it has the potential to quickly and efficiently impart multiple perspectives on a situation. So if you have multiple witnesses to an event and you get them to report back on what they see, you can quickly form a picture of how a situation is tending. So Ross Gibson and his colleagues, um, one of them was a um, defence force person and the other person was an emergency health worker, looked at how this was applied in, in situations of emergencies. And their finding was that this is a very um, important and efficient way to gauge the way a situation is unfolding. What's crucial for my argument is this concept of 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 multiple perspectives. So partly what makes this strong is not that it's just one account, but that over time it has the potential to be multiple accounts. And the other key thing from Gibson and his colleagues that's so important is also this idea that it's a situated account. So what's really important is a guy didn't make this, nor did an institution make this. This is not an authorised version. This is an authored story. This is Teaching and Learning Cinema's account of Man with Mirror. And this pink one is Laura Hindmarsh's account of Man with Mirror. So what the user is then left with is a picture of how the situation is tending. So over time, this story doesn't become just one person's story. It becomes a story that's built up through the accretion of layers of multiple people's stories. But the other thing that's happening is that no change is taking place to Guy's work. Guy's work sits there in, in, in the centre. So that conceptual discovery of Guy's doesn't necessarily change. So it's still a kind of question in my mind how effectively we, Teaching and Learning Cinema, actually accounted for Guy's piece. So this is where recording still plays a role because the YouTube video, which each user sought out, so the New Zealanders sorted out, my mum sorted out, um, Laura Hindmarsh sorted out, to check out actually how does Guy perform this thing. So there's a place for that recording, but that recording doesn't is not able to deliver to the user the oohs and ahs of this really kind of rich but super simple performance of this doubling, of this kind of live and embodied thing. So there's many kinds of knowledge that are uh, many. In my view, there, there, there's a range of knowledge that is really important to us that 
does not digitize well, that escapes digitization, that needs to be experienced in the flesh, that needs transmission from person to person. And of course, I couldn't conduct my research project in Australia without thinking about Indigenous knowledge management. I spent a lot of time looking at this area, talking to my colleagues at the University of Canberra. On the way, I learned something really essential, which was in the First Nations model of knowledge management, all things are in contact. So this concept of hiving something off to the archive is a really big problem. So I'm still intrigued by that because as an appraisal archivist in the Australian government, my job was all about determining boundaries around information. Where is the end of the object? So if we apply that idea to Guy's work from 1976, we know we can't bring 1976 into the present. So when you delve into the world of reenactment, so some of you may, may know people who do like military reenactment, do colonial reenactment, people, reenactment cultures, uh, you know, various reenactment cultures. The problem is always about the boundary. Somewhere just over the hill is the guy in the thongs and the jandal, you know, the thongs and the shorts and the, like, where's the limit? Where's the edge? So that is always an intellectual problem for the archive. So what this idea gets at is that we take away that sense of defining the thing through boundary making. And instead, we're defining the thing through storytelling, through the story we tell about it. So um, I'm just checking the time. So five past one, I think we have to 1.30. So I'm really close to finished with my explaining my idea. Um, I just want to clarify that you're following the points I really want you to take back. And as you can see, we've all been spending way too much on time on Zoom teaching our students. Um, but I do think it is really important to just get really clear. So the model, the real contribution of my research, in my opinion, is this metaphor of the growth ring is this idea that we can have hold this thing inside and around it we can create these layers that can help us ascertain how that thing is tending in its social environment right now. So, and the other thing that's really important from this model is this idea that instead of use deteriorate, deteriorating something, use strengthens. And that is a kind of quite a significant rethink. Some of you who are really plugged in to these conversations in the world of conservation and um, heritage will be hearing this emerge. So for example, the other day on the radio interview uh, about um, with an indigenous architect who was talking about this very, who's been making keeping places and is talking about this very thing of things deteriorate and there are systems in place to allow them to be regenerated in certain environments. So in some ways, what the manual does is it, it's a tool for regeneration of man with mirror. And the properties of it that are important is that it's a chronicle, it's authored, it's made, it's, it's the perspective of Lucas and I. It's our best efforts to try to be as faithful as possible to Guy's work, but there's no effort by us to proclaim a neutral, um, uninvisible backroom position, which is a really common position for the conservator in the world of cultural heritage, that their subjective experience and views are not shared with you, the audience. What this is trying to do, so the other, so that's one of the points. The other point is this one about the value of that subjective experience and sharing that with audiences. So this is the slippages. So the changes the New Zealanders made because they went digital, the changes Laura made because she's a young woman performing this landmark piece from the 70s back to its own audience. Um, and so there were certain changes she felt she had to make. For teaching and learning cinema, we doubled it. There are two of us, so we perform it together. So we stay very true to Guy's work, but these two of us. And that, for an audience, adds or changes the meaning really quite significantly. 
inviting audiences to attend to that change, to actually recognise that this progress of this material from 1976 to 2021 is a site to which they should attend is another part of my research that I'm really still very fired up about. Um, I investigated that in a much more detailed way in an exhibition in 2019, actually working on that specific component of sharing with audiences this process of updating this metadata through an exhibition with a friend where we sought to manualise her work and shared that in a public setting. So I think I'm going to conclude there before I get off on another tangent. So that gives you some time to ask me some questions and ask me for some points of clarification of what I've said hasn't, hasn't altogether made sense. Um, I guess I am feeling very privileged to have Jay and Peter here. And one of the things I hope emerges possibly from this conversation today is I, one of the reasons I set aside my work with Indigenous knowledge management was because I felt I needed to have the right relationship with an Indigenous scholar, with someone with true expertise in this area to investigate this with me. One of the learnings for archivists in the last 20 years is that it, it must be with and for, with not for people. And if we're going to use and grapple with Indigenous knowledge in these ways, this needs to be done with Indigenous scholars, not, not for or beside them. So um, yeah, now I'm going to hand back to you, Simon. All right, well, thank you very much, um, Louise. And I guess, yeah, as she says, um, let's open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions to ask Louise? You're going to be brave. <laughs> You don't have to ask me a question. I always feel like I should prepare one to give to somebody. I think uh, Petter's off mute. That's normally a yeah, good sign. I've, I've unmuted. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm loving these ideas, Louise, and I'd love to talk about it more. I guess what's at the forefront of my mind now is just based on what you said about working with uh, an Indigenous scholar, I'm wondering about... Um, working with communities, perhaps people who are not working within universities and uh, working with materials that are perhaps not accessible to communities because they're in archives. Um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, so that's that. interesting. So, um, thank, yeah, it's, 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 I think I've mentioned to you, and I'm conscious Chris is here. So Chris has got experience in this area. So Chris, you'll have to chime into this conversation. So um, Peter, you and I have talked a bit about this. Um, and I mentioned the work of uh, my brain's a bit fried today. It's a COVID thing. I think we're all feeling the same, marking and COVID and homeschooling and everything else. There's a researcher in Melbourne in conservation called Samantha, whose surname I currently forget, Samantha Hamilton, who was looking at this concept of preservation of doing, of uh, she and I had talked about giving a, a work, a, a kind of panel conversation at one of the archivist conferences on this very topic to do with how to, um, she was really looking at how to empower communities, particularly First Nations communities, to do this caring locally. So instead of getting the conservators in to look after, to help you fix up stuff, and then they come in and they treat the objects and you, know, you put it in the safest environment you've got and, and that's it. So instead of that model, she was looking at ways to share these skills and to make it the task of the community to care for the material to, to, to have this, this place of caring for materials. So for me, I'm really fired up about that idea because in my world of this very arcane kind of film practice, which I don't think of course is arcane at all, but to the rest of the world, it, 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 it's foreign. So in this area, the people who are best placed to actually care for this stuff are the people who know most of, who, who know about it who understand it from the inside, they understand what's at stake. 
and they understand what qualities are important to care for and they can transmit that. So one, one, one subtle thread of my whole research that I haven't been able to find the language to put into words on the page is about this passing on in person. So I started off with this discussion about body knowledge and what you know in your body. Because of course, one of the features of reenactment is that you pass knowledge through your body. And in that process, you learn things at a body level that are quite hard to transition into language. So the example that I discuss in my PhD thesis is about this hand position for Laura, was that she couldn't, we hadn't sort of found the words to describe where you have to put your hands on the mirror. And because you have to hold the mirror for 10 minutes when you perform, it's very heavy. You're holding it up here. It's a very awkward position. So where you put your hands makes a big difference. But to try to convey that relies upon a doing process to actually understand that kind of knowledge. And when you start, the, the threads I got from Wendy Somerville and my colleagues at the University of Canberra and my discussion with them about Indigenous knowledge management was that these kinds of knowings, they, they are, how do we describe them? They are imbued in situation, in context, in body, in landscape, they're, they're, they're situated. They can't be taken, or they can't be adequately removed and datafied. So anyway, I'm raving. Yeah, so yes, I think that this, there's a lot of potential for these ideas. And I'm hoping they're not, none of these ideas are new on their own. What I'm doing is reinforcing ideas that are out there already. Yeah, Chris, do you want to chime in? No, okay. What about Eleanor? She might have something to say. Anyone else? Jay's, Jay's off mute. Yeah, look, Louise, I just want to say thank you. Um, I really like your presentation style. It's actually quite um, hypnotic. <laughs> um, so a lot of it sort of, you know, I, I was reflecting on it um, as you um, went through each of the different phases. And I'd be interested in talking more, um, especially about the last point that you made um, about the contextual relevance and the situatedness of knowledge. Um, and it all is, regardless of which culture you come from, it's just that some cultural frameworks actually acknowledge that um, and meaning doesn't necessarily travel from something that moves from place to place or most significantly in our knowledge in industry from mind to mind. Um, so there are kind of boundaries there that I think become um, relevant purely because we're working in an institution where knowledge um, and the sale of knowledge really is a commodity. Um, that is a big barrier um, to, you know, considering or that needs to be considered um, and, and work um, ways to navigate that complexity for Indigenous knowledges um, in archives. And going back to Peter's point, you know, I think the, um, the context for the knowledge in archives that are held by communities, um, whether it's their notebook or their diary, you know, that has uh, meaning. Um, when it travels to a Western archive, it becomes something much more, um, much different to that. Yeah, I think, I think that's, it's interesting because I think you're crystallising for me, Jay, that it's sort of this whole thing about trying to change this public perception of that knowledge is mobile and knowledge is migratable. Like we've got these ideas that have become really, they live with us because of our social media experience, because of our phone use, because of um, the hovering presence of Google, of, of like we sort of, yeah, for me it has a lot of activism in it about pushing back and saying, you know, the no, we can't. Digitization is 
Yeah. And also we forget how unevenly distributed it is. So Mary Carroll, one of our colleagues in our school, attended the IFLA conference, the libraries conference, and her comment was we forget the rest of the world is paper. It's a real first world thing to be so digital. And we forget. So we, we, we can't, we're, we're in this strange place. We're in the wild west frontier of the internet still. And so these issues of digging into what knowledge really is and does to me feel very pressing. So Eleanor, I can see you're, I'm dying to hear from you. <laughs> Hi, Rose. Uh, nice to see you again. I haven't seen you since the first day you came in. So no. um, it's really, really exciting to uh, hear your seminar. So thank you. Uh, you, and I, you and I had a really exciting discussion on the first day that you arrived, you remember? I do. And I remember saying to you how you took me right back to some of my earliest research, which was all about cyber feminist theory and all those things. And as I've been listening to you, this thing, this area of also past and present is making me think about how I might go back to some of those works and work with other people as well, because it's really exciting. And I've just had a student who was under examination on um, things to do with intangible heritage, which again, you know, those momentary aspects, which we've all had in terms of performance and our research, and how do we lodge them and how do we place them again? And that does cross over with First Nations work because I've got another student that's working in that area. And I love the physicality of objects that you've got there, those papers you were showing and how we go back to those kind of time essences that we've done, but they also come back into the spaces that we've got now. So I think that this is really exciting that you're working on and I'm really enjoying listening to you. Oh, thank you for the reflection. Yeah, I think the, um, the, it's sort of, you know, there's a mantra that's followed me in my career, which is everything old is new again. And I just feel like that is just constantly true. And yet um, the reasons why it's new again keep changing. And that's because our context, our technocultural context keeps changing. And I think, I think the thing um, that Jay pointed out that seems really important is it's, it's, it's hard to find the language to describe what's at stake. And I think Peter's talk yesterday was touching on that, like in trying to say, like, it's sort of, it becomes so tiring. Mm -hmm having to constantly restate that there's knowledge that you can't just, people just go, oh, yeah, of course there's stuff you can't write down. Yeah, yeah. But they don't consider what's at stake properly in terms of what is not kept. And this amnesia, this is like, this has quite high stakes. If you take it from my, like, because I'm now forced, my students here will know, I'm kind of forced into thinking about this from a strict records perspective. And there's a lot at stake when we think about holding people to account. If we, if we can't kind of grab hold of this understanding of the variable nature of knowledge, that we've, we've kind of assigned it in our Western frame, we've got this quite sort of positivist kind of definitive version of what information is. In a way we need Yazdan, our colleague Yazdan to be here who was researching the joy of information because he's got some really interesting perspectives there because he's looking at the kind of felt experience of information. And in a way, that's kind of what we're talking about is the felt and lived performance of information. And for me, Eleanor, you'll relate to this. As performers, as people who've engaged with performance, and probably you too, Jenny, that we're working, we're in the domain of performance. And so, of course, information's a performance. It's, mm -hmm. it's a no-brainer. And yet that that is kind of lost. Like we don't, we don't really have the language for that to understand what that does yeah there's some really exciting groups like uh, do you know uh, of in canberra boho um yeah boho interactive yeah yeah 
the way that they get involved with communities and they act out things. And there's yeah. another one in the UK called, um, uh, oh, what are they called? I've just got them here. I was looking at while you were talking. Forced Entertainment. Do you know about Oh, yeah. People? Yeah. 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 They yeah, won yeah, lots yeah, of awards. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's different, but they're really taking on issues. And again, that thing where they've got object or theatre and place and they bring them together in time, but yeah. also integrate with the people in the cities and, and areas. So, yeah. Um, You've got some really exciting things on there that um, would love. I'd love to, you know, be able to work with you at some time on those. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, that's the joy of the university. I mean, I think you guys, it's interesting for me as a newcomer to the university environment, what is so dynamic about the university is it's really plugged the gap that used to be there in art where artists would get together and make stuff. <laughs> that happens really now because everyone's so busy trying to earn their living and so universities have become this place where people can get together and do stuff together and it's an amazing privilege so I hope you know yeah it's it's a very exciting thing to be able to sort of sow these seeds of engagement with you all and I'm really excited to be able to present these ideas to my colleagues in my school and hopefully not instill deep panic in you that this is really far out. <laughs> because when I had to first come and talk to you all, I did sort of think this is pretty far out for information studies. But I'm starting to understand more deeply myself how it connects. And for me, from the archives side, from the beginning, it's all about the authenticity. So I have this whole section in my thesis talking about what archives are and talking about authority. How do you establish authority so that someone will pay attention to a record and say it has authority? And so part of my challenge was to try to understand what is the authority of this document? So I was really interested that I actually moved away altogether from saying it's it's got authority as a record and that its authority is as a story, but a chronicle. And so from that point of view, it has record-like qualities. So students who are here, I hope you're attending to that concept that it's got the qualities that ISO 15489 the standard sets out, but it's actually enacted as a story. So that is kind of quite interesting and that that's possibly got potential for us all to mull over further is this business, it's a new social form, is this idea of something that contains fact that is grounded in something in something really solid but it's an individual expression of that so that space feels quite important okay louise I, and i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna may show my ignorance here but I, I thought you might be interested like the kind of links i was making yeah while you were talking and it's prompted by the fact that during the study visit we've had this week, we were had a present presentation from uh, Mathilde Sorel, who's the yeah. librarian at the Paris Opera House. Yeah. And so I've been reminiscing with Jane and others about you know our times playing in orchestras and things. And I'm as you were talking, I'm thinking about sheet music, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about my which is of course highly formalized, codified form of performance direction. But yes. I'm th I'm remembering as a trumpet player getting a new piece to play and seeing the annotations of previous people who've played that piece and some of them are technical like where to breathe and some of them are artistic like the dynamics and so on and often you they're kind of they've been erased they were in pencil and you can see the kind of erased marks of them so a sort of hint of them and sometimes you can see multiple copies like people people who've it's you know the dynamics are loud and it's been rubbed out and it's slightly quieter and so you get a sense there of some story of performance and of course there's the kind of individual each individual musician's experience of that performance and then the collective uh, experience but it strikes me that there's no there's no way of retaining that story beyond that just kind of anecdotal chance of having of seeing it on that that script if we think of stuff those kind of you, I imagine you might get annotated scores in in archives but they would be yeah. an individual you know pr presumably some prestigious person's annotations so I'm just wondering whether that 
is the uh, it, it's not exactly of course what you're describing but is this the say the sort of similar ballpark yeah it is it is so i've i've been when I've, I've been trying to make for my students a case study of my archivist friend who's work on the papers of barbara blackman and i keep saying to david as you work what i really want you to do is capture your tiny insights like tell us a story about what you how you're decoding this so in a way to 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 capture that that kind of experience of you with that sheet music it would be about finding some way to sort of because it's not just about you know as you say if you get the famous person you're just going to get one layer and what becomes really interesting are these multiple layers. So that's where that Ross Gibson idea of the emergency situation and the multiple perspectives. His most compelling example is the Defence Force guy he worked with who um, talked about, you know, in a battle, what happens is the report, the, 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 they've got a special name that I can't remember, the runners come back and report back on what's going on. And so he gets like 10 different reports. And from those 10 reports, he can form a picture of actually what's going on. And so what's interesting to me in that example you just described is that it's, it's not just your annotations or the person before you, it's the fact that there's a whole bunch of them. And there's this sense that this thing is richer than you. It's bigger than you. And you've got material evidence for that. Because in your mind, intellectually, you know, of course, some people have been playing this piece for generations. But you've got some material kind of experience of it that feels very quite profound when you encounter it and so yeah it's that it's that kind of knowledge so that's the bit that the heritage field doesn't talk well about at the moment so that's why my growth ring metaphor I'm, I really think has a place. So I'm really trying to sort of work this out with my heritage buddies over at the University of Canberra and work it out in the archives field. You know, does this actually extend the language that's already there? My hunch is it does, but you know, that's me. Of course, I'll think that because it's my idea. <laughs> Building all these other people's ideas. Jennifer. Um, Louise, I just wonder, you know, I'm thinking from the other side, you know, um, and you know, likewise, with the uh, example of the score, I was thinking of John Cage's music, for instance, or performances, you know, and, and if I wanted to recreate how, and, you're, and you've got these archives that you're creating with the layers, how am I going to access that information? Yeah, that's, so what I'm, where I'm going to, going with that, is so the next project I'm going to do is thinking more concretely about that. So I'm going to I have a, a fellowship at the University of Canberra that is going to dig into this, do another case study um, for a work that Lucas and I have already we worked on at 10 years, oh, 2013. And we're going to explore how to wiki how it. So that it can, because at the moment, because as you say, that's the limit. This is like, it's a really key point you bring up. How can you, Jenny, actually access this? And at the moment, you need me to give it to you, basically. I mean, you know, we could sort of put it in distribution as an artwork that you can buy because, you know, it's a print. So it could circulate as, a, as an artwork. And, you know, we have done things like send this off to the National Library. So, you know, it's in various places. But, and you can download the manual from our blog, from our website. But in terms of you then printing it out and fold, like you're never going to bother with that, basically. So we're now looking at, okay, so how can we kind of, what, what's the democratic space in the internet? Like where's the democratic place for this? Where's the commons? Of the internet is my question and the research project that Peter and I are looking at at the moment is kind of trying to establish these local commonses for people where they can control their commons in the way they want I'm not sure I haven't kind of used that language before Peter but it's something in there about this idea of so so what Lucas and I talk about doing for horror film one which is another one of these works is you know internet archiving, archive.orging it, you know, making a, using the most, really look, taking a digital preservation approach. So we're going to start 
with digital preservation and go from there. So we're going to try to sort of be archaeologists of the internet and think about the long view of the internet. So, you know, I'm, I'm really intrigued by blockchain, whether that actually has the potential to be the equivalent of the midden, you know, like what, that's kind of what we're looking for is what, what is the midden? And then there's a question about what should go into the midden. So I've, I'm, I've got a lot of questions about that, which is where I believe it's up to communities. To, it's up to, you know, no one should be the gatekeeper. But then, of course, then there's a whole question about radical sharing. So, look, it just goes on and on, doesn't it? I think we better um, better better draw a line under it there. Thank you so yeah. much, Louise. That was what fabulous, fun. interesting. I had a great discussion. time. Thanks and for I your think opportunity. You're presenting. You, I think you mentioned to me you're presenting that or giving a similar presentation at a conference in a few weeks. Is that right? Yeah, next week for the Thanks. ASA. I mean, um, you know, I'll have to be tightening up my archives angle for the archivist. <laughs> but um, I'm I'm just really I'm sad that I didn't get to ask you a question, Philip. I would have liked to have asked you about cataloging and you know your music projects, but never mind. next time. So I'm super grateful. I love, it's just so great to get the opportunity. Thank you, university. Thank you, colleagues. I'm really grateful. Well, thank you, okay. Louise. See you guys. Okay, bye-bye, Bye. Bye.